not ashamed of it. I'm not racist. I have my reasons and get used to it. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Jack Jewel podcast, a show where we talk about all the crazy things going on in the world, particularly LGBT discourse from the perspective of a moderate gay man in the UK. So thank you for joining in, or if you are new, you are very welcome. Thank you to everyone who has recently subscribed, almost at 5k. We are literally almost there. Maybe even by the time this is posted, we will be there. So I'm very excited, enjoying everything so much right now. And I'm very excited for this episode because this is a bumper packed episode. I have so much to talk about. So we will be jumping straight into it. It is Monday. This needs to go out before Thursday, which is when we have our general election in the UK. I thought I could do an election special today where I talk about which party I'm going to vote for and why. And before we continue, if you like this, please make sure you like the video, subscribe and comment down below. If you don't know what to comment, just put a little diamond emoji to show that you support Jack Jewel and I would really appreciate that. Right, so Thursday is a big day in the UK. It is our general election. It is causing a lot of controversy, a lot of <laughs> bleakness and dismay in this country as for all of you US listeners or Canadians or anywhere else you may be in the world, I will try and explain so this is a bit relevant to you, but we have had a political party uh, in dominant power for the last 14 years, the Conservatives, who are supposed to be a centre-right leaning party, <laughs> but everyone is furious with them they are expected to lose a massive majority. They currently have over 300 seats. I believe they're going to be going down to, the polls are saying, between 40 and 70. So it is a huge loss for them. But there is a lot of anger, a lot of animosity and disappointment with the Conservatives because time and time again, this country has voted for them on important issues such as immigration and the economy. And they have not delivered on anything. In fact, they've actually gone the complete other direction. In line with me doing this podcast and everything I talk about, I've been on such a big political journey. And no matter what I believe in now, which may change, I think the biggest thing that I'm grateful for is how I've, I've learned to understand largely political ideologies. We don't have good and evil. We have people that have different philosophies that they think are conducive to a healthy and prosperous society. And it is a much healthier mind for me to live in. It is a very liberating place to be in because if you listen to a lot of my other stories about my woke past, I've been in circles where people view the, the world through a very simplistic lens of goodies and baddies. And in London, in the queer community, left-wing politics is good. And anything right of that, even centrists are considered, you know, hateful, racist, all that kind of stuff. And the queer community, queer, 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 they don't understand how far left they've gone in their ideas. They're not center left anymore. They believe in quite radical things, quite far left, both socially, economically, culturally, all those kind of things. So it can be very difficult to contend with them in a conversation because it's not even that you want to say that you're center right in ideas, it's that you're even not far left. So that's a difficult thing to go through. But I think it's really important for me to talk about this, you know, as a gay guy who it will be voting Reform UK. I want to lay out my reasons for it because all of these kind of lefties will label this party as far right, racist, fascist, white nationalist, none of which are true. It's just a campaign to, to smear the party and to not actually challenge any of the things that they're saying or any of the policies that they're proposing. I have followed this campaign very closely. I've watched all of the election debates with the two main parties, the Tories and the Labour Party. I've watched some of the other debates that have the leaders from the other parties. So I've really done a lot of research into this. And what's very clear to me is that both the Conservatives and the Tories have been completely overtaken by the establishment, the mainstream media. They say they'll deliver on certain policies that, you know, the majority of the country wants in order for us to have a prosperous economy. But they don't do that because the powers that be, we call them, you know, the liberal elites, they're more concerned with holding their position of power from what I understand and appeasing the woke narratives, right? So that they are ingratiated by the media 
and the institutions, the universities, whereas none of these bodies actually speak for the common person, the common worker in the UK who has a family, who has kids and needs to get by, even, even single people, especially in rural towns. I think people who live in major cities such as London and are part of this woke culture, they are so out of touch with what it is like just to be an average person in the UK, a British citizen who is concerned about quite important issues, and they will smear those things as racist. And I think it is juvenile. I think it's extremely patronizing. And I want to talk about some of these things today. Now, Reform UK are a relatively new party, but they are led by Nigel Farage, who is quite a controversial political figure as he was the one who initiated the campaign for Brexit and then that ended up being voted in. And then he retired from politics, but he's now returned, as he says, because he sees the country is actually in need of someone like him who is speaking common sense, who is raising the issues that no one is brave enough to speak about and will speak for the populace. So it is very much a populist movement trying to speak for the common person. And when looking into everything, I really agree with it. But it's very clear to me that we've gone so far in the other direction, in the woke direction, that we need a good centre-right party at the moment that will actually listen to what people want and implement some of the things that we need as a country. And I guess that's what I'm going to talk about today. Let's just go through some of the things that I like that Reform UK are talking about. So the biggest issue that they're putting forward is immigration. And this is a topic that most of the parties are afraid to talk about or tackle properly. The Tories have promised year on year that they will lower net migration, but instead they have liberalized the system. It's just gone absolutely insane. Last year we had a net migration of 700,000 people arrive in the UK and our problem with illegal immigration is growing and growing with small boats crossing the channel from France of which nothing still has been done to tackle that massive security issue and unfairness that that's happening in our country. This is what a lot of you you get such polarized views from the LGBT community or the woke the woke mob because they all say that the Tories and Labour are both Tories that they're both hard right political parties and they only say that because they're not far left enough for them. You know, anything anything right of like socialism for them is basically right wing. But it's actually the opposite that's true. So the Tories have, in spite of us having Brexit and having what could arguably be a case for better border control, which is why people largely voted for Brexit, they have instead chosen to use their autonomy to liberalize the whole system. And net migration has just increased and increased and increased. And the fact that you can cross on a boat illegally and arrive in the UK and pretty much near 100% of them are granted asylum, it is representing a huge issue and people on the left the woke left they will like to smear any concerns about this issue as racist but like i said i think it's extremely juvenile it's not understanding for your average family perhaps in a rural town or who live near the coast where a lot of these migrants come in most of them young men, young single men, economic migrants, they don't understand what it's like to have your whole town change with hotels filled with illegal migrants, filled with people from Islamic states that do not hold liberal British values, that are against homosexuality, that are pro-Sharia law. And I'm not saying this is all of them, okay? It's not. But the truth is, this narrative that they spin, that these are people who are fleeing persecution, their lives are at risk, they're in France. They're in France, which is not a terrorist country, which is not uninhabitable due to climate change. So it's it's very much not the case. And when you go and see these boats, the majority of them are single young men. But people in London, it's irrelevant to them because they can take the moral position of, if you don't agree with this, it's racist, but they live in their nice flat with their nice job, decent salary and parties on the weekend. They don't have to really contend with any consequences of this. And of course they do in terms of everything that's happening as a result. And Nigel Farage explains why he thinks immigration is such a big issue. None of the other parties will acknowledge the fact that having mass immigration, uncontrolled immigration, just unlimited people come into the country, cannot have a negative impact on the, on the economy. When we're an economy that is struggling with the cost of living, housing crisis, rents going up and low wages and 
you bring in mass migration, there's going to be even less houses, rent is going to go up, and it is the perfect recipe for big business because they can then accept more and more people who will take lower and lower wages. So it is making the country poorer. Now, do we accept some people that are highly skilled? Yes, and I think immigration is really important for that case. I'm pro-immigration in that case, and I'm also pro having a good balance and helping the rest of the world when it comes to asylum seekers. But only 15% of the people coming to this country in terms of net migration are highly skilled workers. So if you're someone who is struggling to pay rent, struggling to find a flat when you move, on an NH waiting list for two years, frustrated that your company has not raised your salary in three years, then this may not be the only reason for that, but it is a huge, huge reason. And you wanting your hard work to be paid off for the government to put British citizens, British residents first is not racist. It's not an issue of race, it's, it's an issue of numbers. So they're proposing that they will control migration, they will stop illegal migration, and they will try and bring migration down to a net zero, at least for a few years to try and stabilize the economy. And maybe zero is obviously hoping for a lot, but I do think we need radical change in this country as if we just keep going up and up and up, this situation is gonna get worse and worse and you'll have more parties like the Green Party and the Labour Party just denying the fact. They just say, oh no, immigration's great. What the left, the woke left don't understand is that they pretend to be anti-establishment, but they're very pro-establishment when it suits their narratives. So they'll love the BBC because the BBC does have a huge bias <laughs> towards left-wing politics, even though they're supposed to be nonpartisan. And then if anything is platformed on those channels, they will say, oh my God, far right. But they're playing into the establishment's hands because the powers that be in this country are globalists. They don't care for the common working person. They care about big business, they care about cheap labor, and all of those other things are secondary to them. So if you're someone who cares about minorities and people of low socioeconomic status, then these policies could potentially really help. And that is where right-wing politics is actually really compassionate because it puts people in your country first. It recognizes that you can help as many people as you can, but there's always gonna be more people to help, right? So we can have unlimited immigration and even with unlimited immigration, there will still be people who can't get here. So there needs to be a line in the sand somewhere. And when I think about the broader political issues and then I condense it down, scale it down from wider UK just to me, I think, okay, well, what would I do in my life if someone said, right, so you could probably get by on 80% of your salary. So because you can, will you give 20% away and I'm thinking wait no hang on I've, I've worked really hard for that like I've I've had a lot of debt to pay off to get to where I am to have that job and it goes the same for these people they want the government to be virtuous they want to say these virtuous things but would they scrimp by and donate lots of their money would they have an illegal migrant stay with them if they think that illegal migrants are just zero security concern zero threat to the country that we're just having all these unvetted people come in, then they should be pretty happy to have a couple of them stay with them for a couple of months, you know, till they get on their feet. Would they feel safe? Because when you speak to these people, you realize that the woke left pretend to be for everyone, but they're actually the most self-involved and self-centered people there are, right? So see this graph is that 2020, this is the amount of illegal migrants that had come under 10,000. 2022, almost 50,000. And this record is just going up and up and up. We had the record number this month, nearly 900 migrants arrive in small boats in a day. If you're happy for people in seaside towns in, in the UK to have almost 1,000 people in one day illegally enter the country and you don't care how that impacts them or that they might be fearful for their kids' safety. They don't know where these people have come from, the majority of them not from Europe. And a lot of these countries have totalitarian states, Sharia law, oppression of women. Then you're just on another planet if you can't have compassion for that. If you believe that that's racist, like I don't, don't know what else I can say to you. The truth of it is, this ought to be the immigration election. Because whether we talk about housing, 
whether we talk about the facts that rents are up between 20 and 30 percent in most of the country in the last four years, whether we talk about the roads, whether we talk about infrastructure, we are living through a population crisis, an increase of 10 million people since Mr Blair came to power, and frankly, it's making us poorer, it is diminishing our quality of life, and it's nothing to do, nothing to do with race or any of those issues, it's to do with actually putting the interests of our communities first. Exactly. There is nothing racist about that. And this was on the BBC. The BBC is sick. The BBC has become a joke, right? We have to pay a TV license fee, which goes to the BBC because they provide free entertainment news with no ads. And they are supposed to be politically neutral, but they totally are not. And you can see when this when they panned to the audience, every time Nigel Farage spoke in this debate, they panned to this random man who was just like, <sighs> every single time they use these tactics. And I really do believe that they are not impartial. And let's have a little look at what Rishi Sunak, our prime minister, versus Keir Starmer, head of the Labour Party, who is due to become our next prime minister with a supermajority, their conversation about immigration. You're sitting there with tens of thousands what? of people. But just, just when let me illegal finish. migrants with tens come to of our thousands country, thousands of people what will you do with them? It's their a claims. very simple question. Well, can what, you... what will you... I can tell people what I will do with them. I will put them on planes to Rwanda because they shouldn't be able to stay. Years. What will you do <laughs> with illegal years. migrants who come Honestly, to our country? His, his, what, his, what, what, what will you do with them? It's a simple question. His plan is what to What will take... you do with them? They need to be processed at the moment. Processed? They're not. These which means giving them, which just to be clear, will mean most of them will be given asylum. They will, what, what will get the right to remain in this country. At the moment, 100% of them are effectively uh, being granted asylum in this country because they but, can't go anywhere. They can't go anywhere. They cannot, the Prime Minister knows this, and if he thinks I'm wrong, he should say so. Because they're not being processed, they cannot be returned to where they came from. Can they, Prime Minister? If he wants to correct Rishi that, is it now's his chance I'm, to do it. I'm, I'm they very cannot clear be returned. About where we'll well, do you know where these people come from? No, he's not answering the question. Do you know where you they can come see from? That. Iran, you can see. Syria, Afghanistan. So when Keir Starmer says he's going to return people, is he going to sit down? Are you going to sit down with the Iranian Ayatollahs? Are you going to try and do a deal with the Taliban? It's completely nonsensical. Yeah, so it's, it's quite depressing the options we have. And I do believe that Rishi Sunak, head of the Conservatives, our current prime minister, his campaign has been far better than Keir Starmer's. At least I know where, where Rishi Sunak stands. He has a plan for immigration to deport people. He wants to bring down taxes, like he says. He wants to reform the welfare system so that more people are working that could work and that are just living on benefits. He has clear ideas for all of his policies. However, no one trusts the Conservatives to actually implement anything because they've promised again and again all these things and they just haven't done it. They've actually done the opposite. So for that reason, I wouldn't be able to vote for them. But Keir Starmer... If you watch any of these debates, he has zero ideas and is the most vague politician. I can't believe that our country is going to have someone who is so beige and has zero vision about anything. You ask him about the NHS or National Health Service, he says, we need more doctors, we need more appointments. Yeah, that's it. His plan for immigration is to smash the gangs. So he wants to scrap Rishi Sunak's plan to deport the migrants to Rwanda. They have this deal. I'm not saying that's a perfect plan. It probably is very flawed. But at least it's an idea to take illegal people, unvetted illegal people out of this country. He, he doesn't have a clue. And everyone's prediction is that illegal migration, legal and illegal, is going to skyrocket under labor. I'm feeling very grim about all of this because I think reform is making good strides, but I feel like we're about to go into our Joe Biden era in the UK. And then a lot of left-wing people will actually realize how bad this is and that we need reform. We need ch meaningful change and we need to stop all of this globalist shit. But <laughs> this video is from Glastonbury, a massive festival in the UK. <laughs> Is an Irish man. 
So for people listening, this is at a stage sort of rave scenario where there is a blow up boat that looks like one of the small boats crossing the channel and it has all these dummies in it in life jackets and it's being bounced around, basically celebrating illegal migration. These people are so stupid. These are the woke elite. Their concern is how many festivals can I go to this year? How many drugs can I take this year? They have the privilege of being able to spend hundreds of pounds going to Glastonbury, a festival, having the time of their lives. And then they're there like, F your borders, like F your racism. They don't have, they're not the people that are suffering the consequences of illegal migration. And they are useful idiots. That is all they are. And this is another depiction of what this side thinks. For people listening, this is a poster from Queer Britain, which is a small museum about queer culture. It says, not gay as in happy, queer as in fuck your borders. And in the caption, they say, no one is illegal. No. No. Some people are illegal. The fact that you think that just because someone arrives illegally to our country, that they are somehow the most virtuous person is just so stupid. <laughs> I was speaking to someone about this recently. I didn't know that they had such sort of radical views, but people will say, oh, well, this is just like saying you pick someone out from a crowd and anyone could be a rapist. And no, it's not. It's very different to picking someone out from a crowd in the UK who has a registered address, who was born here, who works here, who has, who has lived in a liberal democracy, than someone who has come from the Middle East alone as a single 21-year-old man. It's definitely not the same. And I'm not judging all those people. We have some asylum seekers who are lovely and they integrate and everything. And that's great. But all of this stuff is just so stupid. People do not realize how idiotic they are. They are being used as a pawn in our establishment. And they just don't know, they're playing right into their hands. You're a mother fleeing with your toddler and a baby from bombs falling on your home. You're a criminal. You're an elderly grandmother, you have trouble walking, and you're trying to reunite with family. You're a criminal. You're heavily pregnant, trying to escape with nothing but the clothes on your back. You're a criminal. You're a teenager and you don't even know where your family is or if they're even alive. You're a criminal. You're a diabetic. You've lost your medicine. You've not eaten for days. You're a criminal. You're in a wheelchair, trying to escape the dangers of war. You have to cross streets strewn with rubble and muddy fields. You're a criminal. You desperately need to find a safe place, but can't find an officially sanctioned route. You're a criminal. This government wants to criminalise desperate refugees for taking what they see as the wrong path to safety. It's not always possible to take the right path when you're running from bombs. No matter where you're from or which war you are running from, your life matters. No refugee trying to find safety should be treated like a criminal. This is the woke liberal elites. All of these celebrities who have the privilege of virtue signaling, getting involved in politics, when their lives are so far removed from your average person. They obviously have a lot of money. They live in very nice areas where there aren't going to be any asylum seekers or legal, illegal migrants around them. It is just, it is so disconnected from reality. They're also a pawn in the establishment. You just learn this, like, I don't, I don't like to call it red pilling, but when you go on this sort of realization that so many things you thought were lies, it makes you very skeptical. And I want to remain that way. Always want to keep questioning things. I don't want to just say, oh my God, reform is great now. I just love everything about them. No, I'm still remaining very open to being wrong. But when you realize how much control the mainstream media and the establishment and institutions and the liberal elites have over what our population think and feel, especially the useful idiots, the woke, the young woke, it's very chilling. It's extremely chilling.
but at least as a society it's sort of your average person that doesn't buy into this stuff it's actually often people from lower socioeconomic status who don't have the privilege of worrying about microaggressions that see this stuff as bullshit because they have much more important things to worry about so they're far more connected with British values and Britain as a whole than these people. Anyway, so another policy I love that they're suggesting is on their economic reform and they're proposing we raise the tax threshold to 20 grand a year, whereas it currently sits at, I think, 11,500. So anyone who earns below 20K, which is a very small amount, a very modest amount, if that's your, if you earn only 19K and you have a family, that is tiny, right? So they, th they don't think they should have to pay tax. And I think that's a great idea. And they really want to lift people who are stuck on the benefit system, who are disincented to actually work, because if they do, the marginal gain isn't worth it. And they think this will motivate people into work. So you can see that right-wing ideas, they are about empowering people to be independent and lift themselves up and believe in themselves. And that is that's a really beautiful thing about right-wing politics, right? The left tries to help people who are in need, which is also great, but then it too promotes this culture of you can't do it alone. You need the government, you need the nanny state, you need to be looking to us for help, we need to be a crutch for you. Everything has pros and cons, right? The right-wing stuff can become uncompassionate if there's people who just are not in a mental state to lift themselves up and be empowered. And that's why we can have this policy. We can, like N Nigel Farage is saying, if someone is able to work and they refuse two jobs, then they get their benefits taken away. I think that's totally fair. But then if you're someone who is sick or mentally ill and you're properly assessed and you can't work, then we have these socialist policies that can help you. So it's like finding the right mix, but at the moment, it's just not. Also, their stuff on net zero is quite interesting. Now, I'm not a climate change denier. However, I am curious to learn more about all of this because just like everything, when you learn that some things you were told were wrong, you start to think, wait, I've just listened to every news broadcaster, mainstream media source documentary that the planet is just going to die. And I'm still leaning towards the fact that climate change is very much an issue. And I think, I, I doubt that the whole thing is a conspiracy, but it is worth taking a step back and thinking, how much have I listened to both sides of the argument? I think it was Peter Boghossian, I heard him say in a podcast, you shouldn't make your mind up until you've listened to both sides equally. So listen to one side 50%, listen to the other side 50%. And I think that's really good advice. And you could do that with climate change. But it's not so much about whether climate change is real or not. It's that the current government's policies for net zero are just inconceivable. And they are going to be so costly. And they are going to be the most costly on the working class. Which again, the woke left, they don't think about that. They just think, oh, green is moral and it is virtuous. But who cares about the working class? <laughs> they don't think about that. So... They're scrapping the net zero goal. They want to take a more measured, gradual approach. And I think this is really important when in the UK we have got rid of a lot of our industrial manufacturing and action to decarbonize the grid. But then all we've done is imported the same goods we need from India, China, who actually have lower standards when it comes to emissions than us. So we're just exporting our carbon emissions and then making it worse. And it is a guise for us reaching net zero. The UK produces 1% of the world's emissions. And then we have to contend with India and China and other markets that have no intentions to do this stuff. So it's going to damage our economy even more. And I understand that it's not an argument just to say, well, just because they're not doing it, we shouldn't. I don't think we should think like that. But we shouldn't completely shoot ourselves in the foot by trying to get there faster than anyone else. And then again, affecting the working class the most, you know, it's not realistic. NHS, our National Health Service is really important to me. I have had a lot of health issues in my life so far. I'm only 30 years old, but I have an autoimmune disease. I have chronic pain. I have really felt firsthand the mess the NHS is and how demoralizing it is to receive a referral letter and it be two years away 
where does that leave you? What if you're someone who can't work? Then you are put on benefits, your mental health declines, you're not participating in society, and that's, that system is heavily oppressing you. And people blame the Tories for destroying the NHS, but in actual fact, our percentage of GDP has increased year on year, spending on the NHS. We're spending over 11% on it now. It's hemorrhaging money. Things are not getting better. They're getting worse. And the Reform Party are the only party talking about revolutionizing the system, changing the system of the NHS. Every other party just wants to put more money into it. They want to try and hire more doctors and nurses, which obviously isn't a bad idea. But they don't have any vision for how this system, this national treasure, and this is why it's so political, because the NHS has always been free for everyone. And the UK has always been really proud of it. But for a long time now, it's been completely broken. And there's so many people who are just unwilling to say, guys, it's a wrap. Like, this isn't working anymore. It's like being in a stale relationship and just forcing it to work. Things have changed. Our population has exploded. We have so many new types of technology and treatment options available, which means there's more niches in medicine. We need more specialists. And there is the government, the, the one thing they have done, which is terrible, is they've put a cap on the amount of people that can train and qualify as medical professionals in this country, even though we have a shortage of doctors and nurses. And why? Because they're using mass immigration to accept people so that they can pay them less. And then we have all these doctors going on strike saying you're not paying us enough. Well, the reason they're not paying you enough is because people are happy to immigrate here, arguably from countries that need their expertise as doctors, nurses, and get paid for less. So reform are proposing that they have a mixed system where people that can afford to pay into an insurance scheme um, to help fund the NHS. So it is sort of semi-privatized in a way, but then when you use the NHS, it's still free at the point of use. I'm all for that. I've been very lucky to benefit from private healthcare through my job. And it completely changed the game. I was no longer waiting for two years. I was waiting for a week. And the standard of care has been much better. Even just how quickly I get seen when I go into the waiting room, like people, the staff seem so much more relaxed and attentive. You go to the NHS, it's a total shit show. Like you'll be sitting in the waiting room for three hours before you get in there. The doctors are trying to get through people as fast as possible. It's a really awful experience. The infrastructure is so old. And that's not to say the actual skills in there aren't great, but I just feel, I feel really bad for people working in that profession because it is not easy. And the way the NHS is treating its staff right now is absolutely terrible. So they want to reward people for being doctors and nurses. They, they want the frontline NHS and social care staff to pay zero base rate tax for three years. You know, they want to actually incentivize people. Who would want to train as a doctor right now unless, unless you just love the field with every five years of being, because you're going into a system that is going to work you to the bone. You're going to have no social life. You're not going to be paid in a way that reflects the work you're doing. And you're going to be faced with patients who are extremely upset, angry, and in pain, and they're gonna take it out on you. It's a really terrible deal. Crime is an issue, and particularly in London, knife crime and theft. As you guys know, I had my phone stolen. I finally got my new one, which is why this camera looks better stolen out of my hand. And again, I don't see any of the parties recommending anything meaningful to resolve this. But reform are saying we need to bring back stop and search and police neighborhoods of high crime. But then the Green Party literally said to them that's racist. And actually, Green Party, it is you guys who are racist because <laughs> suggesting the only reason you stop someone is because of their race. In actual fact, they want to say if you acknowledge statistical averages and that we see crime rates higher in certain communities, that's racist. So acknowledging the truth is racist. And speak to some people of color in these neighborhoods, they will say, actually, we want stop and search because my cousin was murdered from a knife crime. And to a lot of people, accusations of that's racist is completely secondary to whether someone lives or dies is murdered. If I had a kid, I would rather them get stopped and searched in a neighborhood and be annoyed about that than 
the threat of them being stabbed being higher. But again, it is the woke white liberal elites that like to say this is racist, this is racist for their own virtue signaling. And I'm not saying that it's easy. It's not. I know that some people will harbor animosity for that, but it's a good deterrent. And also, if you get these policemen in integrated into the communities, which they're not right now, most of them are sitting behind a desk and people get to know them, then stop and search won't be as much of a we're attacking you. It can be more of a we're just trying to protect the neighborhood, make sure everyone's safe. This is kind of a routine thing. What other option do we have? It's like, do you what's worse? Someone telling you you're racist or someone's son being stabbed and dying because it's the other. It's the same thing with like what's worse, being called transphobic or letting men into women's prisons. I'd rather be called transphobic, please. All right, this is the last one, which you guys will know is very important to me about reforming the lives of young people. Two things here I'd like to call out. One is trying to introduce a patriotic curriculum, which I think is really important. So have a balance of history that we're teaching kids that obviously the UK has done wrong things in the past, like every country, but actually this country has a rich history of leading in creating incredible inventions, ending slavery, being role models for secularism and tolerance and democracy. And that should be taught in schools, whereas a lot of kids these days are being raised to view their country as evil colonizers and to hate being British. It's worse in the US, but it's definitely happening here. And another one is on all the woke shit. So they want to ban the transgender ideology in primary and secondary schools. I'm totally in favor of that. You've seen my videos. If you've not, go and watch my one on Pop and Ollie. They are an LGBT education organization that go into schools and deliver workshops on these topics. And when you look into actually what's being taught, it's too confusing. It doesn't make sense. And too many gay kids are being told that if they are gender non-conforming, it means they are the other sex. And I am anti that. I am anti that because I think it's homophobic. And this is a belief system. That's what the queer community don't get. It's a belief system that you have a gender identity. It's a belief system that you're born in the wrong body. And in this country, we are secular. In public schools, we do not teach kids religion. And that's the truth. Vicky in Oxfordshire, who asks this, will you protect women's right to single sex spaces from any and all males, regardless of if they hold a GRC, a gender recognition certificate? Rishi Sunak? Yeah, yes, unequivocally. I get that not all of you will agree with my position, right? But I'm being clear with you. Sex means biological sex. You have to change the Equalities Act to deliver the security of women's spaces and women's services. Is... That's what I believe the right okay. thing for our country Please. is. Keir Starmer said it was important to protect women's spaces and added... I will treat them as I treat all human beings with dignity and respect. And I'll tell you for why. <laughs> the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, standing in Parliament, making an anti-trans joke in front of the mother of a murdered trans teenager. I will never, ever allow myself to be put into that Richie position. Okay. You can hear the woke people. <laughs> Those are the only people to react that way. These two are so funny because people say Keir Starmer is like a headmaster at a school. Standing in Parliament, making an anti-trans joke. In and his voice, anti-trans joke. Anti-trans joke. In I can't do it, but it's really annoying. And then Rishi Sunak is like the head boy. But I'm being clear with you. Sex means biological sex. And I really, I really do see that. Um, so once again, Rishi Sunak, I'm kind of clear where he stands, but I don't trust their party to do anything because he recently tweeted, we shouldn't have gender ideology in schools. And it's, we're here saying, yeah, Tories, you've had, what, the last 10 years to try and resolve that? You've not done it. Keir Starmer says, he says we should protect women's spaces, but then he says, but I believe we need to treat trans people with dignity and respect. I also agree with that, but... It's not clear what that means then, because are you saying then, but they should be allowed in the space? He doesn't have any idea for what space they should go into. And when people ask, he has nothing to say. He uses this anti-trans joke thing anti -trans joke. to have a one up on Rishi Sunak. But the truth is that Rishi Sunak said Keir Starmer doesn't know what a woman is. And it's because in the past, Keir has said it's not right to say only women have cervixes. Have, have a cervix. So it's a fair point, right? <laughs>
Here's the kind of downstream effect these things have. And this is from some nurses in the NHS talking about their struggle with single sex spaces. It's degrading. It feels it's humiliating. It's humiliating, yeah. It's an open changing room. Um, there aren't anywhere, there's nowhere to hide in there. We all have to get changed out in the open. Um, so we're vulnerable. So it says eight nurses are suing their employer for allowing trans women to use their changing rooms. We have Muslim women, we've got Christian women, and and we've we've heard about women, you know, wearing clothes underneath their uniforms so that they don't have to actually get completely undressed in the changing room. Um, and to which, wear a vest and um, leggings under your uniform in the, in, the in the heat at the minute, it's just absolutely mm-hmm. unacceptable. Yeah. She was caught, kind of told that your staff need to be re-educated. We're just a bunch of ordinary nurses um, and it, it, things, things have just escalated um, to this point that um, we, we just don't, we don't want to let this go because it's, we're going to end up with no safe spaces for women if we do. There's a path forward through those conversations to acceptance because ultimately including transgender people isn't hurting anyone. Uh, what's hurting people is this fear that has been stirred up. And that's not just hurting transgender people, it's hurting everybody. No, what's hurting people is, as a man, you saying you're entitled to women's spaces because your brain doesn't match your body. Sorry, I have compassion for you and what you're going through, but it's not women's responsibility to take the hit for that. And for anyone to suggest that women being uncomfortable getting undressed in front of men need to re-educate themselves you are the new misogyny in the queer community. You are anti-women. <laughs> it's just so, it's so crazy how it's not even that they say, oh, look, I get it, but fundamentally I disagree because I just really care about trans people. Okay, it's that their stance is actually, no, these people are bigots and they need to re-educate themselves. It's absolutely vile. Even when I was more woke, I didn't hear something like that from a woman and think, oh, she's just evil, or she needs to just get over herself and get changed in front of a dick. Like, no. Jane, I am listening, and I've long championed women's spaces, biological women's spaces, and Jane, it goes back many years. Before I was a politician, I was the director of public prosecutions between 2008 and 2013. No, but I don't care about all of that. What I care about is you saying that you're going to allow men to identify as women, making GRCs easier... And then they can come into women's spaces. Yes, we do want to make the process more dignified, but that does not mean... No, it's it's uh, not uh, about being dignified. This isn't about being kind or dignified. This is about protecting women. I understand. You know, Um, why are you you putting our dignity on the line for a very few people? You need to treat them differently and say, no, you have to have a third space. You can't take anything from women. Jane, when it comes to women's spaces, biological women's spaces, in relation to the particular example I was going to point you to was when I was doing work um, trying to drive up the protection for women who've been subjected to violence, domestic violence, sexual violence. Which is not interested in the past. This is daily. This is toilets, changing rooms. This this isn't about what you have done. This is about what we want to be done. Jane, just hear me We don't care about what you did in the past. We want you to say... Sex cannot be changed and you will protect us from men coming into our space. Jane, we will protect... I have protected in the past and worked with those protecting (sighs) women's spaces. I will do that in the future. They will be protected. I'm particularly concerned about uh, violence against women and girls and the and the biologic and the need for biological for spaces for biological women to be safe uh, there the same in sport the same in hospitals but Jane, can, I'm not, can, no, can you no, say no, now I'm, can you I'm, say now that you will will not allow men biological men under any guise to come into women's safe spaces we will of course protect. can you say that because we shouldn't have to be kind to these very few men you Look. need to think about 51% of the population who are sick of the absolute twaddle that comes out of your mouth when we ask these questions. Yeah, Jane. <laughs> Hats off to Jane. That was brilliant. But you can just see how scared the politicians are to talk about this. And I don't see any politician 
saying, we're going to advocate for unisex third spaces in all establishments, encourage private businesses to have third options if they don't. No one's saying that. They're just saying we're going to protect biological women's spaces. Okay, well then, what about the trans women? Because you're not proposing any solution to that. It's just a complete guise. And this is going to be our prime minister. Here's another labor. Here's another labor person running for parliament. A trans woman with a penis would use which lavatory? Well, look, I think it's important that all people feel safe and have dignity. And and she respect. needs to go to the lavatory. Yeah, which one does she use? I think there are a range of options that would. Well, she hasn't got a range of options, thinking. respectfully. She's got a she's got a door with a woman on it. She's got a door with a bloke on it. Which one does she go in, Bridget Phillipson? Well, many businesses and many public buildings also in, also provide the option. Yes, sadly, this restaurant only has place. one with a picture of a woman and a picture of a man. So, which 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 door does she go through? Well, I would expect they would have a range of different. No, options. this restaurant doesn't. Okay. It's just got the two. So, hats off to this radio presenter because he is just being completely upfront and frank. There is no beating around the bush. And I have to say that I would absolutely hate being a politician who is tied to a party that means I cannot actually answer questions directly. I don't believe that most of these people can't answer questions. But politicians today, the majority of questions you put forward to them, they just respond as if they're answering a completely different question and they just keep doing that over and over again until, until you just quit and I would die doing that because I am so outspoken and I will do so in public even if it lands me in shit so there is no way my party would have me out because I wouldn't be spewing the party lines that's another reason I like reform is because they're smaller they are frank and honest and they speak for common sense. They're talking about all the issues that no one else wants to talk about. And they're just completely upfront with what, how they feel about things. They're not dodging every single question in that way. Nigel Farage is the politician that has been doing that the least, from what I can see, of all these debates. I actually fully understand. Which one does she use? I would want people to treat one another with respect. She needs to use the lavatory, it. Shadow Secretary of State. Which one is she to use? Which one is she to use? Imagine these people in real life, excuse me, um, where's the bathroom? And then the waiter is like, I want you to be treated with respect. Um, yeah, sorry, where's the bathroom? I just think everyone should be treated with dignity and respect. I'd be like, are you okay? <laughs> How many brain cells have you lost from being a Labour MP? I, I would hope that that person, whoever they would happen to be, trans person of, you know, uh, it's not clear, would... Well, it is. It's a trans woman with a penis and she's desperate to go to the loo and she's really getting desperate now. I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't want that person to feel at risk. Equally, I wouldn't want biological but, women to feel intimidated... So where does she go? Space. It's about seeking common sense solutions and being practical about it. I would hope that they might be able to, for example, try and find a compromise where no one... So she's got to leave the restaurant to find somewhere else, is what we're saying. No, I would expect that a business would provide a range of different options so that people, all people, is there... biological women and trans women, can find a way so that no one feels that their safety or dignity is compromised. And I do think it... where, it comes to tra where it comes to trans people within our society... I understand the challenges that the, the long process that many people will have gone through in order to be recognised in a gender different to the biological sex into which they were born. That is not a short process, that is an extensive... But you seem to have checked earlier this week, you said she should use the female toilet, didn't you? Look, these are these. I want to make sure that everyone, right. incro yeah. where it comes to this discussion, that we do we have this discussion in a way that is respectful. Is it not respectful just to want an answer? God, it must be so bleak being one of these people that is supposed to stand for things and stand for your country and not be able to just answer a very simple question that is just a very grim existence and vocation to have i would absolutely loathe 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 here's an ad that i saw on twitter roll the clip Okay, so for audio listeners, there is a woman in a lift and then a trans woman comes along who is very clearly male, so much taller, 
uh, short hair and gets in and then the other woman suddenly looks very fright- frightened and startled and then before the lift closed decides to flee and then it says trans women and gender diverse people deserve to feel safe <laughs> so many issues with this first of all it's just so unrealistic because it's it is an elevator and i'm not diminishing women's experiences here but if you're a woman, I'm sure there are lots of women who would still share an elevator with a man. Although if you've been through abuse, then maybe not. So maybe it is legit in that sense. But I think it would have been much more powerful if they had done this like in a bathroom and a woman came out of a stall and saw a six foot trans woman and wanted to get out. I think that would maybe land more realistically. But it's also just this, they deserve to feel safe. Yes, but what part of a woman exiting a lift makes you feel unsafe she's not threatening you she's not trying to attack you sure it probably feels really shit for someone to just not want to be in the same room as you i think that is difficult for anyone trans or not but it shouldn't make you feel unsafe if someone walks away from you you know unless you're a child and you're being left alone on the street so it just sums it up it sums up that women's concerns don't matter and that a portion of males in society that feel a certain way matter more. And that is the message. Now, because the Reform Party have been making strides and they have been one of the biggest talks of the town when it comes to the election and the debates on the front page of a lot of the newspapers, they have been beating the Conservatives in the polls, averaging at around 20%, which is really, really high. There naturally has been a lot of attempts to smear the party and to find accusations of racism, of far-right nationalism, so that the mainstream media can produce this evil picture of reform and then validate that in the eyes of the woke elites. And this is one example of something that happened from a Channel 4, who are mainstream media company in the UK, known for very progressive documentaries. They've done an undercover expose on a campaigner for reform in Clacton where Nigel Farage is running. And he says the most heinous outlandish things. The immigration, you know, use the word illegal, emphasize illegal, especially if you have the door with a bunch of The reform canvasser then gives his view on Muslims and what the party would do with mosques. Sick man, sick mother it's yeah. a cult. It's a lot of what well, if you don't know about Islam, it's the most disgusting cult out. Yeah. With kicking all Muslims out of the mosques and turning them into wither spoons. <laughs> as well as his opinion on the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Yeah. Yeah. I've always been a Tory voter. What annoys me is, we got him. What's good is he? You tell me, you know, it's just wet. What, Sunak? <laughs> He explains party policy on topics including the NHS and climate change. What was that climate change? Well, that's not complete shit. If you go back something like 10,000 years, and the Scots, Scotland was hot in Spain. And wearing his blue and white reform rosette, he gives his views on how to stop the boats. You've got DL, haven't you? And all the places near Dover, army recruiting, get the young recruits there, yeah, with guns on the beach, target practice. And just show them. That's what the Greeks done. They know about that. And the yeah, Greeks the shot them. Look at the Australians. <laughs> they wanted none of it. I've just seen the ring fence Brad for Stan round. Just do that. You know, that was like having. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've got these bastards running our country. You must be joking, mate. Good luck. Keep flying that flag. <laughs> so the reason I'm going to reform is because the situation yeah. is that Rishi Sunak ain't worth pissing yeah, on, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mr Parker urges this undecided voter, who says he's a paramedic, to help get Nigel Farage elected. And he offers this advice for treating migrants in his ambulance. And do us a favour, if you're a paramedic and, 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 and uh, not getting your ambulance, just dump oxygen on the bar so you say it else. You know where I'm coming from. <laughs> right. That was the most crazy set of <laughs> rhetoric from anyone. <laughs> To say so if you're listening if any of that was hard to make out this is a an elderly man campaigning for reforms or going around speaking to civilians <laughs> handing out leaflets and he says a number of crazy things saying the prime minister is a packy very racist remarks saying that 
the mosques should be turned into Wetherspoons, which is a pub chain that it's like a cult. He says that the migrants should be just shot on the beach, that a paramedic should deprive them of oxygen in an ambulance to kill them. He says that climate change is completely fabricated. And it's just, it's just thing after thing after thing of the most ridiculous remarks. And it just so happens that Channel 4 happened to be with this guy going undercover. What are the chances? And I'm not saying that someone wouldn't be like this, but do you really think that someone is going to go campaigning and not only say one of those things, but all of those things in the space of, what, an hour? So naturally, the media jumped on this. It was all over the news. Reform Party is racist. They attract racist people. They're a racist party. And then when they looked into it, turns out that was only one side of the story. I thought this is just so over the top. No one speaks like this. This is like an Alf Garnet comedy sketch going back 50 years. Uh, and yet overnight we found out that the guy is an actor. Hello, my name's Andrew Park. I'm an ex extreme experienced actor. I've been in plenty of films. I've worked with quite a lot of A-listed actors. I've done a lot in Palmer Studios, a lot in Warner Brothers. I've also been flown over to Serbia to be involved as a character in a video game. I've done Virgin Train adverts and many more. So we called in this morning. The Daily Telegraph called in this morning. He denied being an actor. After a short period of time, he admitted to other media outlets that he was an actor. And then we found his own website, where he speaks and advertises his services for adverts, for acting, whatever else it may be. And he describes himself as being very well-spoken, but he has an alter ego. He can do what he calls rough talk. If I had my way, this lot would be out of here, I'm telling you. Absolute waste of drinking space. The whole lot of them think they're some sort of Brad Pitt or they're doing some big movie scene somewhere. <laughs> you honestly can't write this shit. So, turns out he's an actor. He lied about that. Then he told the truth. And then it turns out that he doesn't have a cockney quote-unquote common accent. He has a very well-spoken, posh English accent. And he also advertises on his website that he does secret filming and specializes in rough speak. He's also worked for the Channel 4 before. Channel 4 deny any allegations that he was paid, that this is a setup. But th there is just... There's no chance, regardless of if he was paid, if Channel 4 orchestrated it, if he's just some crazy activist that want to take down reform. How could this be real if this guy doesn't speak this way day to day, has a completely different accent, and then decides to go campaigning for this party, puts on... It, it, it doesn't add up. There's no way that this can be real. And it is disgusting to me on a number of accounts one, it goes to show that the establishment are panicking. And instead of actually tackling reform's policy proposals, this is all they've got. Okay, all right, well, they're making good points, actually. And there's a lot of working class people in this country who need these things. So, nah, that doesn't really work for us. So let's just, um, let's just make them out to be racist. Terrible. And the other part that sickens me is how racist this whole setup is. Because... This guy is basically insinuating that in order to harbor racist, terrible views like this, you need to be, quote unquote, a commoner with a rough accent. That is so demeaning, patronizing, discriminatory towards people with those kind of accents. You have a Cockney accent, born and bred in London or wherever. You can be someone from a working class background with that kind of accent and be a very lovely person. So really, why did he need to put on the accent? Can you not be a posh English twat and harbor those views? A upper middle class idiot? Because that would have been fine. But no, this woke elite, I keep saying it, the people that they care about the least are the common working class person. And they will happily, particularly white working class people, throw them under the bus as racist and disregard all the concerns. And it is disgusting. So because of this, it makes me want to vote reform even more as when the media and politicians 
resort to these tactics, it means that they're actually getting at it, right? They're getting something right. And if you want to buy into the fact that reform is just racist, then you're an idiot. I watched their whole campaign rally yesterday in Birmingham. Over 5,000 people attended. They had their biggest donor for the party. I remember his name off the top of my head. He's Muslim. He's a millionaire. He's defected from being a Tory member to reform. And he did the most passionate speech as a person who's not white, who's Muslim. But then people will say that reform are anti-Islam racists. Not true. And they have had a few candidates that have been identified as having said very inappropriate things on Twitter. You know, three candidates, I think. And in the debates, everything on Nigel Farage has been about them, that it's been about this, nothing's been about policy. And I think, of course, that's an issue. But people need to get it into their heads that every party will attract extremists. If you're on the left, the Green Party, they've had to deplatform eight, ten candidates for being anti-Semitic. They have lots of radical Islamists in their parties who believe in Sharia law, who call for al Akbar when they get elected. The Labour Party have had loads of problems with anti-Semitism and racism. But they don't want to focus on those things because this gives them what they need about reform. And unfortunately, reform is the only party who actually are promoting center-right policies and believe that they will implement them. The conservatives are woke. So if you're the only party that has some right-leaning values, then where are the far-right people going to go? You know, it's their only place. It doesn't mean that you accept them. And people need to get that into their heads. It's not, it's not necessarily reform's fault that someone else decides to promote their party and then also harbor bad views. They, they literally condemn them. They say, we don't want that person. And it's the same with people that comment on my video. Like, I'm not responsible for what you comment. But if you post really hateful stuff about a woke TikTok, I know that I can be very critical and make fun of stuff. But if you go too far, you know, it's not my responsibility for that. That's on you. So there you have it, guys. My vote is with Reform UK this year, and I am not ashamed of it. I'm actually very proud that I have been able to think critically and come to a decision. I don't necessarily agree with every single thing they say. Do I believe that they can deliver everything they say? Well, I know that they can't because they won't have enough people in parliament, but their whole plan is that over the next five years, they want to grow this populist movement that speaks for common sense and the normal British citizen that hopefully in 2029 election, they'll be in a good position to actually come into power. Who knows? Who knows? But not ashamed of it. I'm not racist. I have my reasons and get used to it. David Tennant is the new person on my blacklist. Another person who is a woke liberal elite and has the privilege of harboring radical views while condemning people that need a voice. This is him accepting an award at some LGBT award ceremony. We shouldn't live in a world where that is worth remarking on. However, until we wake up and Kemi Badenoch doesn't exist anymore, I don't wish ill of her, I just wish her to shut up. <laughs> Kemi Badenoch is the Minister for Women and Equality. She's a Conservative Party member currently in power. And she has been one of the leaders when it comes to advocating for single sex space and the CAS report, protecting kids from gender affirming care, speaking common sense and truth. And then this guy is smearing her saying, until she doesn't exist. So I'm so sorry, David Tennant, that a woman is standing up for kids and the right to have dignity in single sex spaces. You being an ally to the community isn't something new. You've been doing it. But recently, you've obviously really stepped up for trans and non-binary people in a time that's so, so needed. What made you do that? 
I don't know that I feel like I've done anything that I wouldn't just sort of be normally doing. I mean, it's for me, it's just common sense that, oh, that, that there, there should be any suggestion that people aren't allowed oh, okay. to live the life they want to live and, and, and to be who they want to be with and to express themselves okay. yeah. wholeheartedly. I mean, as long as you weren't hurting anybody else, then everybody else just needs to fucking butt out. I don't really understand why. It's controversial. Yeah, there is. And yeah. Yeah, it's just all complete hypocrisy. Oh, if you're not hurting anyone, well, what if it is hurting women to, to know that they cannot go to a women's shelter and guarantee there'll be no men there? That they can't go into a changing room and guarantee they won't see a dick? So it only matters if you're trans or non-binary and you're living your authentic, true self and F everyone else. Everyone else just needs to shut up. All these women need to shut up. David Tennant, you are sick and you are in a position of such privilege and power that you can't even comprehend why this issue would be important to women. And you're setting the worst example of a useful idiot in the mainstream media, which is another thing that surprises me because a lot of these illustrious actors are obviously incredibly intelligent people who can get inside the minds of another character and embody a whole being of another person to play a role on screen, yet they can't seem to have any empathy for women or against child abuse and sterilizing kids or not telling kids that you can be neither man nor woman. And ding, 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 we learn there's more to this because the reason David Tennant believes this shit is because David Tennant has a non-binary child, a boy. So they've trans their kid. Here's them with the big non-binary flag. And here's him dressed for pride for people listening. It's huge rainbow wings. It's a rainbow dress. It's rainbow leggings. It's a rainbow fan. Long hair, which obviously is totally fine. But so what he's done is most likely told his gay son that in order for you to express yourself, you need to not be a boy anymore. And he's validated that idea for his son. And I just want to play a clip from Helen Joyce, which is an absolute own on the situation. That a parent who um, has told their child something that is not possible, which is that it's possible for the child to be neither male nor female, ha gets, gets very angry with people who say, look, everybody is male or female. So that's the thing that David Tennant isn't saying there. What he's saying is, uh, in my family, I pretend that it's possible to be neither male nor female and Kemi Pivanok in her insistence that women, female people are a distinct group and have rights is uh, contradicting what he said to his child. Yeah. She always says everything perfectly. It's totally true. He's given his child a promise. Okay, because you like to wear dresses and you're growing your hair out and you're feminine, then you're not a boy anymore. You're actually neither a boy nor a girl. And we're going to have this flag. I'm going to be an ambassador for LGBT and F any woman, fuck any woman who contends that notion. Fuck any parent who is concerned about the stories of kids going on puberty blockers and regretting it. F them all. Though so you're just so stupid. <laughs> Imagine if you told David Tennant 10 years ago, yeah, so you're going to have a kid and then you're going to make a promise to him that he's actually not only not a boy, but not a woman, not, not a girl either, because he likes dresses. He'd probably say, wow, that sounds a bit far-fetched or I don't really understand. But this is what the cult mentality is when you're out of it. It's just so inconceivable how someone can believe it. But when you're in it, you just don't realize I kind of feel sorry for him in a way in that sense. Kemi Badenoch responded with a retort. She said, I will not shut up. I will not be silenced by men who prioritize applause from Stonewall over the safety of women and girls. A rich, lefty, white male celebrity so blinded by ideology, he can't see the optics of attacking the only black woman in government by calling publicly for my existence to end. I think it was very well said. I think, I don't know whether she's playing the identity politics card here to sort of show the hypocrisy in his narrative because it's his side that will also always weaponize race. So if somebody criticizes a black person in parliament because they have said something right wing, sorry, because they have said something left wing, then people will just say that that's racist, even if it has nothing to do with their race. If someone makes fun of a black 
politician who's left wing, they will be like, oh my God, that's just racist. Whereas in this case, he's actually explicitly said for her existence to end. And while I don't think it's about race, maybe she's just making a point that actually, if this was the other way around, you guys would have no issue making it all about race. Personally, I feel like she didn't need to do that. She could have just let it speak for itself. David Tennant, RIP. Let's talk a little bit about Pride. And I want to play some clips here from Pride this year of some of the lovely things we've seen in the streets. This is just such degenerate behavior. I'm so, I'm so unproud and ashamed that this is presenting parts of the community and it goes very unchallenged unless it's from a gender critical feminist or a right wing person or me. It's just an absolute disgrace. What is with all of these men who think people want to see their dick? I'm hearing crickets. And you know, I could get a little bit on board with it if any of these guys were attractive or had good bodies none of them do they're all a state he's wearing a bunny mask and just walking down the parade naked as if oh this is gay acceptance for people to see my dick no it's not put it away you're gross i don't understand the desire i couldn't imagine anything more mortifying than being completely exposed and walking down the street i would you couldn't pay me to do that I would be mortified. Do these people not have any dignity or privacy? I just don't get it. Here's another clip of a rapper on stage. <laughs> it's giving heart disease on steroids. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's mean, but it's giving, it's giving fat fetish. Now, this is a very, very large man in a thong and a harness rapping on stage. Look, if this is only adults, then whatever. If people want to see that and they enjoy watching that and it's not an eyesore to them, then go for it. And somehow that's liberating and we should celebrate morbid obesity. If there's any kids near there, absolutely no way. But once again, I don't get it. I don't understand what this has to do with being gay and celebrating same-sex attraction in our history. Zero sense, have to say. So this woman, Yasmin Benoit, or whatever, however you pronounce it, she's like the leading asexual activist in the world. So this is an image of her, Piccadilly Circus, on the largest screen in London. Asexuals assemble, hashtag we are everywhere. And she has become the poster child for asexuality. Asexual representation matters, our recognition matters, our protection matters, our voices matter, we matter. Thank you all for your support throughout the day. And that she's there holding the asexual flag, dressed very provocatively, although I would not have issues with her outfit here. And she looks pretty hot, to be honest. I don't get it. Like she's, you can be someone who's not interested in sex and think that you're somehow marginalized. She's not these people aren't marginalized. They just want to be celebrated. They think people not glorifying them is that they don't have rights or that they're not equal in society because they're not glorified. No. I, there's no one I'd have less in common with as a gay man than a woman who's not interested in sex. Those two things are like at the complete opposite ends. But yet it somehow has something to do with me being gay. <laughs> It's, it's literally the opposite. <laughs> You're not oppressed because you don't want sex. You're probably autistic, actually. And the reason why you're so obsessed with this is because of the obsessive nature of autism. Now, some of you may have seen that I actually strutted my stuff <laughs> in Pride London this year and asked people on the street what they thought of LGBT matters. So I'm very looking forward to this video coming out. This was my look. So I do like doing eye makeup sometimes. Um, and then I painted a rainbow on my cheeks. I painted my mustache pink and my lips black. 
it started off well, but I ended up looking a complete mess. And part of that was kind of intentional. I sort of wanted to dis, not disarm. I wanted to blend in to the queerness community. I was given they, them. And, you know, very soon the makeup was smudging and it was a whole thing. I was wearing these tiny blue short shorts. Obviously, if you're watching, you can see all this, but I'm looking forward to this video coming out. Oh my God, I am absolutely wrecked from interviewing all the honeys at Pride London. But you know what? It was a really great day. And while I disagreed with most things people said, everyone was really lovely and really kind and so open to talking, even all the controversial issues. So, you know, I really want people to be kind when I upload the video and it's probably inevitable people won't be. But you know, there was one or two that were so good and I have no sound, which is so grim. And then I also had another one interviewing a trans woman, which was also very juicy. And then at the end, she was like, what's your channel? What's your channel? And I was like, uh, just search for Jack London Pride interviewing people. But that wasn't really good enough. So unfortunately, I can't upload her, but very good. Very fun. I got some real humdingers, I have to tell you that, from the crowd. All right, guys, that is it. That was a big episode. And I'm sorry, but I just realized I forgot to collect some comments to respond to you from the last episode. So the next time I do one by myself, I'll do a little bit extra for that, as I've been getting some incredible comments on all my podcast videos. And thank you to James for that last episode. That was really fun. Please let me know today, did you go to Pride? What did you see? <laughs> what did you think? If you're in the UK, who are you going to be voting for? You're going to be voting for the Tories, Labour, Reform, or maybe the Green Party? Ew. But it's okay if you do. Or the Liberal Democrats. There's more. But, or maybe you're not going to vote at all. And maybe the stuff that I've talked about has swayed you to voting Reform, because that would be pretty cool. And with that said, I will see you very soon. Thank you.